Okay, welcome back to a new day here on TV3. It's a Friday and hopefully by now you've woken up and feeling the sunshine. Now, we've just ended 2013 and there's been a lot of criticism about uh, leadership, about governance. And so stepping into this year, we're wondering how leadership will be. Will it be inspirational? Will it be motivational? And to help us discuss this, none about myself, we have Reverend, uh, sorry, Pastor Albert Okran from ICGC. Good morning, how are you? Very well, you? Fine, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Good um, to see you. It's a blessing to be here. <laughs> <laughs> blessing to have you here. Right. All right, so leadership. I know you've been talking a lot over the years about leadership, inspiring leaders, inspiring leadership. Are we getting it right? In some regards, yes. In other aspects, I think there's more that we could do. It starts with the perception about who a leader is. And one of the things that we've said over the years is that leadership is not about a title. Because if there's trash in a community and somebody holds the title of assemblyman or assemblywoman and does nothing about it, and an ordinary person takes the initiative to do something about changing the situation, in that particular situation, that person showed leadership rather than the person who holds the title. And so seniority, rank, title, and other things could be attributed to leadership, but really, it's about influence, about empowerment, it's about transformation. And so just for that context, it will be important that we talk about the fact that a leader is one who gets people to do things, to achieve laudable objectives, just for context. Okay. It makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, we, when we were talking about this earlier, um, I said that we, we've come to the conclusion that people who are meant to be leaders always have this, do you know who I am mentality. Um, what, is it you, uh, what are the characteristics of effective inspirational leadership? The moment you have to remind people about your title or your rank or your position, you're losing it. If a, if, a person has, if a man has to tell the wife, I am the man of the house, I'm the head of the family, you're losing it. It's not meant to be rammed down people's throats. Very often people respect what you have, look out for what you're doing, and then give you some, accord you some respect for what you do. I think that the critical things that a leader will do hang around using information, selling a vision, working through people and then very importantly making decisions a leader who doesn't make decisions cannot lead leadership involves making decisions some Sometimes of them very very, very difficult decisions in our part of the world you find that people and um, leadership does not tend to like making tough decisions on the political sphere i think that our four-year democratic system sometimes makes leaders make short-term decisions that ultimately are not beneficial in the long term. Mm. If I know that my tenure is for four years and I will be judged on a four-year tenure and there are decisions that I can make that would benefit the country in 10 years' time, I ask myself, in the ne next election, will this benefit me? Mm. And so that is why some people advocate for people who call themselves one-term presidents who will take strong decisions and make those changes that we need, even if it means not getting elected the, the, the second okay. term. But that's another discussion. But generally, um, lead, great leaders make good decisions. They realize that indecision can be, can be painful and can be costly to their people. Somebody described decisiveness as a razor-sharp cut that gets things done, and indecision as a ragged cut that leaves tears and, and bad edges. And so, great leadership means getting people to move. I listened to former German President Horst Koller when he was last in the country. And of all the things he said, the thing that kept stayed with me the most was something he said about the paradox of the traffic jam. And he said that when people are in a queue in traffic and they see the traffic moving, even if it is very slowly, they follow with hope that it will get to their turn, even if it will take some time. Mm. But when they are in the queue and they see others joining the queue ahead of them illegally, they tell themselves, what's the point in staying in the queue? That is, when, well that is when people decide to break the rules and say, it's, it's, there's no point following. Right. Yeah. Now, in an, in an atmosphere like this where there is huge unemployment, people coming out of universities with no hope about how to get jobs, one commodity we have not sold very well, very badly as a nation, is hope. 
we tend to underrate the importance of hope and motivation but believe me when a young person comes out of university and knows that they cannot get a job but they can be made to hope and believe that if they work on themselves if they follow certain principles they can start their own business it may not work in year one or year two but in year three four five it will begin to get results that person will stay in the queue hasn't got a job hasn't seen the breakthrough they want but will stay in the queue and keep working their way forward but when they see their mates just because of political patronage get a brand new four wheel drive i, I was speaking in was 701 kilometers away on our springboard road show and i was speaking to a group of young people and they were very appreciative of the principles of entrepreneurship i was sharing with them but one of them said to me you know something what i'm saying is very true but for me i mean i mean nukes if i get a deputy minister position in, in a few years <laughs> i'll get yeah. a brand new four wheel drive he was cracking a joke Easy about it go, right? but then yes yeah but it sent a it's message serious. that what you're saying is true That's but for me think. another route is, is also available where i could just scheme my way into a political position and, and, and get a car and that's a faster route now what happens to his colleagues who are with him they look at that and they say oh so we get to sit in the sun or we get to to, to stand in the sun and you get a short route mm. to the top then they begin to agitate and mm. if that agitation is not managed you will get to a point where people say listen we've waited in the queue long enough we've, we've looked out for direction long enough and nobody seems to understand our needs and our aspirations and when it gets to that point it will be very difficult to manage a mass of people who feel let down and so hope is a powerful community a commodity that as a nation we must cultivate and encourage okay in the president's uh new year message he said 2014 is a year of hope I heard it. and uh, many have said that how do we remain hopeful when the signs are not clear so in this instance, how do you instill hope in people who are indeed hopeless? They don't know what to look out for. The signs are not there to be mm -hmm. hopeful. How do you instill hope? It is very annoying to tell a person who is struggling to have hope without giving them a clear direction about the future. It, it, rather, it rather makes them even more agitated. And so the challenge for us going forward will not just be to talk about hope great leadership spells out priority areas clarity listen this is where we are going anyone following me there are four things i want to achieve the great the best test of a great leader is somebody whose vision can be articulated by the ordinary person on the street mm. the person says following this leader we will achieve one this level of income two this level of employment three this level of ict penetration four this simple but clear then we follow that with a breakdown of programs mm. every minister every leader every manager in your team knows that these are the priority areas my success will be measured along these areas the budgetary allocation will follow these areas i personally believe that we sometimes try to do everything which is not good enough mm. we must have leaders who, who, who will say i will just focus on these three things feeding Ghanaians yeah. uh, people who are hungry are hungry so we need thematic yes, areas clear th thematic areas and it would mean sometimes putting other aspects slightly on hold oh, not yeah. abandoning them altogether but not making them priority and then not just having them but articulating them to the point where everyone knows Understand. everyone on the street understands where we are going and it's easy to measure success when we are clear about where we are going we don't give general champion enough credit but even now how many years after i still remember very clearly operation feed yourself yeah. very clearly one nation one people one destiny total manpower development and deployment i mean clear objectives i'm not saying that that meant that he was a successful leader i'm saying that at least one thing you can give him credit for was an attempt to clearly explain what he was doing as a leader i think it's it's a culture a tradition that every Ghanaian leader be it in the political sphere religious corporate should inculcate clearly spelling out your priority areas selling it engaging people about it you will be some and one of the things we've not done also why are we so divided along the lines of MPP and DC? Life is more Good than MPP and DC. I am hungry. Who cares about MPP? Who cares there. about Too NDC? Much coloration. Listen, give me food to eat. Forget about NDC. Forget about MPP. Mm. I would have thought that by now, 
a month or two after the election, the president, every president should make a deliberate effort to engage the leaders of all political parties. In, I mean, people will tell you, the, the hawks in the party will say, listen, you are going down to the level, you are in charge. Believe me, if a deliberate, respectful effort is done, people who head other political parties will respond to the fact that we have one president for the next four years. Mm-hmm. It will show respect. It will get them to recognize your leadership. And for all that it is worth, when you engage people and you sell a clear program, they are obliged to to, to challenge and oppose your leadership right. because yeah. of partisan political consideration. But at least you send a clear signal that in this era, we respect you for what you have, we respect you for what you bring, and we want to explain where we are going to you. It brings some return, and ultimately, our democracy can mature much better if we go about it that way. Sure. Rev, let me ask you this. Um, daily, uh, in the newspapers, on radio, even on television, um, we generally in this country are quite cynical and very critical. We criticize everything. Not anything, everything. Well, sometimes constructively. Sometimes constructively. <laughs> now, how important is it in receiving criticism as a leader? Because obviously, like you're saying, discussing certain points. Well, I find we can discuss them. Uh, certain people, people air their concerns or their, yeah. uh, you know, their opinions. Then it becomes a point where you know some people are trying to defend where they're coming from rather than taking it as constructive criticism and opening the forum. Let me, let me read a quote from a book I was reading last night. It says, A leader with lieutenants who always agree with him reach the council of mediocrity. Ooh, deep. Mm, wonderful. <laughs> 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 it, to be fair to ourselves, criticism is a part of life. Yeah. And great leaders take criticism in, in their stride. And they chew on the the varied angles that people bring to a discussion and when they're taking on board all the angles then go ahead and make a decision what is negative about it is that aspect of our criticism that sees anything that comes from this angle is wrong it's wrong and anything that comes from this angle is good why are we not questioning that way of doing things why is it that before a debate starts in parliament the whole of the minority bloc says this is bad the whole of the majority bloc says this is good and there is somebody employed as a whip to make sure we all vote in one direction i think that sometimes the people that we put in power betray us very badly it cannot be possible that all 110 from one side say this is good Mm. and we 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 think it is good when they are they are sometimes so glaring deficiencies in the argument and then sometimes the government is doing something that is so positive and then every one of the opposition says this is bad Mm. with one voice with one accord i think that we need to grow out of that wholesale criticism Mm. having said that constructive criticism is the bedrock on which we improve. Without that, we'll do things the same way every single year, and there's no point talking about the new year because it will be the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I'm regrettably right. Yeah, indeed. Has a church failed? The church is one of the strongest sources of hope in this country. Are they doing While Whilst the church well. may have... I'll tell you two things. I just talked about criticism. Mm-hmm. Anyone who wants to criticize the church is invited to do so. Sometimes I read headlines about things that happen in churches and I say, we should not do this. But having said that, let me talk about the positives of the church. The church is one of the strongest pillars of hope. The church keeps people in that queue I was talking about earlier on. Believe me, not just the church, but what I may call the motivational arena or industry. It keeps people hopeful. It keeps people believing. And I want to encourage us not to fight the church. Because if we lose that element of hope, the kind of society we build will be ungovernable. But sometimes you see certain things coming out of the churches and you ask yourself, why is it happening in this place? That is is where God lives, really. (laughs) But you see certain things. I mean, talk about the opulence. You talk about the activities of certain people who are supposed to be revered. Yes. It's, it's not inspirational. Would you like me to respond to it? Yes, please. You know, bad news sells. 
Yes. You know that? Of course. I was in church one day when my pastor did something that was absolutely phenomenal. He took the offering, put the offering in front of the church, and asked everyone who had need to come and take it and take it away. And people I didn't hear this man. Why would you hear it? Because it's, uh, well, it was reported in one of the media houses. But it's small. not even about publicity. He, he didn't want publicity. He just walked up the stage. He didn't even want to stand there to be photographed doing it. He just wanted to do it. But I'm saying that bad news sells. This kind of thing will not gain traction in several media houses. And not well, just that's what this, the should be doing. I have been part of several initiatives, contribute, donating blood, contributing to the Children's Cancer Unit. I've seen it firsthand. I get involved. We don't publicize them because we are not doing it for cameras. Yeah. That is our mission. But very often, the interest of the press is not there. But let one scandal break. You see us running with our cameras. That's all right. That is how we are raised. Because but we I'm saying that, that we don't for say every scandal from one the oh, house of the Lord. Let's not make a mistake. The church is human. But what we also don't understand is that God brings together imperfect people to build them up. The kind of searchlight we throw on the church, if we threw half of that on the political space, nobody will survive. Mm. But it's good. The church is there to model leadership, to set a good example. So we are happy that they threw the light on us. And we are encouraged to continue throwing the light on us. All we are asking is that as you throw the light, don't be selective. Throw it on the good, <laughs> the bad, and the ugly. And it will okay. help build a great society. Okay, I ask that question because I'm thinking that you know, you, you sometimes you find certain churches, you know, maybe not your church, but the ones that are coming up, they want politicians to come to their church so that people will be okay. attracted yeah. to their church. Meanwhile, they know that this politician is doing something very wrong. And I expect them to take up that leadership position and say, look, you're here to serve people, but you're not serving them properly. You're doing A, B, C, D, it's bad. But you don't find a pastors and our reverends and our archbishops criticizing our leaders or advising them let me use that word advising let, let them putting this, them in the right let me respond to this in two ways I, i'm happy you, br you bring this up the bible talks about a, a prophet called nathan who went to david one day in private and said to him a man had several sheep and had a party and took the sheep of one one a poor man who had only one and use it for the party. What do you think should be done? And the king said, he, he must be killed. Him, and then he said, oh, you are the one. You've taken somebody's <laughs> wife. Now, that kind of correction is done privately. It may not be publicized, but sometimes the kind of correction needed for a leader is that quiet, behind-the-scenes engagement. Sometimes, also, there is a need for public correction. And in a certain regard, when a leader is doing something publicly, that is upsetting God's order, the pastor, the prophet, the leader will stand on the pulpit and speak out against it. And sometimes you find that um, society responds because of this very polarized nature. Mm. Even when the leader does not mention anyone's name, something is said about the quality of leadership we need as a nation. And the next time you hear people from one end of the divide or another draw out their guns and attack that person we see by our actions that don't talk about us leave us to do what we like whilst you may dominate the media discussion and seem to have silenced the person the long-term effect is that we build a society that is not self-correcting and so going forward we must show the capacity to receive such correction and to move forward as a nation and that i think is the key mm. to the future that's very Pastor nice. Albert uh, just before we do go, uh, could you also ask your leaders in the churches to stop doing conventions during the middle of the day? Because people leave work, and they will leave work and they'll come and do all every day. And you see all the government vehicles parked up, and there's nobody in the offices. <laughs> Why would you do something in the afternoon uh, and expect everybody to come? Do it when everybody's available, so you, that you stop uh, the improductiveness of certain offices. I think <laughs> that one of the things that we have done is to advertise our programs more than six months ahead of time and ask people to take their leave if it is the case that they want to come for the specialized morning sessions. But there's a point about productivity. And productivity must never be sacrificed for spiritual gain. I love that one. I, I love that Reverend one. Reverend himself. Yes, Pastor Albert Okran. A pleasure talking to you. It's a blessing. As always, as always, he knows it all the time. Definitely.
Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me and God bless our homeland Ghana.